So, most people like to give a, a title to their preach. Tonight's title to the preach is that God justifies the humble. And I believe this preach or this message is going to set a lot of people free. It's a message that even in my own life, I can see how on both sides I've had struggles. So if you've got your Bibles with you, please would you turn to Luke chapter 18, verse 9. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Sorry, let me put a timer on because I have a tendency to either go over or under. All right. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will, who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So on that, I just want to have a quick prayer. So Father, we just give you thanks, Lord, that it's your word and that your word interprets your word. And Father, I pray that as persuaded as I am about your word, hearts here would be just as persuaded when they leave here. Father, I pray that you'd set people free of the bondages that they've been held in. Father, I pray where there's mind struggles or strongholds, I pray they'd be broken. And Lord, we thank you that you're a good, good father and you're, you're a loving father. And your desire is that you'd call all children unto you that would come humbly and joyfully. Amen. Amen. So just to give you a bit of background about a Pharisee, these were the religious people of the day. In fact, they were the leaders of the religious sect. Pharisee means separated and undefiled. What they used to do to show how holy they were is they'd go into the cities or go through the streets and they'd pray aloud, God, and they'd make big, uh, just a big deal about themselves. Praying, pretending to be holy, it's all about me. Everything was about them. They'd even be walking in the streets and randomly stop and just pray so people could notice them. It was all about outward works. When it came to tithing, they were very diligent. You couldn't steal one point from them when it came to tithing. Even if there was a little mint tree growing under a garden tap, they would tithe on that mint tree. They would literally go and count the leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one for the Lord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one for the Lord. They were diligent when it came to tithing. They believed that they were righteous by their works. They believed that they were in right standing before God by what they had done. They used to fast twice a week for atonement of guilt. These people were diligent. They were diligent. But if you hear what Jesus says about them, it's quite scary. So we need to understand why he says these things. The interesting thing about the Pharisees is they started off very, very well. What the Pharisees used to do, or how they actually started, 
is back in the day, about 300 years before Jesus came, around the Maccabean era, there was so much syncretism. Now I know it's a big word, I'm going to explain it. I had to learn what it meant as well. Syncretism is when you join religions. So what they had done is the religious people around them had started to infiltrate the Jewish religion and the laws, and they'd started to become watered down. So the Pharisees decided, no, we are going to be separated. We're going to stand for the word of God. And it started off well. And I've been in that place where I also did that. But they went from starting off well to getting to the place where they believed that they were made righteous by the things that they did instead of by God. Matthew 23, 27 to 28 says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You see, what started to happen is the Pharisees started to brag about how good they were. And they'd go into the marketplace and they'd make a point of showing everyone how amazing they were. In fact, when you look at how he starts thanking God, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, that I'm not a sinner, that I'm not a tax collector, that I'm not an evildoer. You see, there's a big difference between a testimony and bragging about yourself. As Christians, it's a fine line. Sometimes, we start giving testimonies about God, but we actually like to point at how cool we are or how much we've done. We need to be careful of that. A testimony always points to the goodness of God. It gives God the glory. If you want to know the, de- the difference between a testimony and bragging, ask yourself this question. Who gets the glory? You or God? 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says this, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. That's Paul writing. It's very important and very prevalent to us today. What we tend to do is we look around us and we start to compare ourselves with the people around us. Ah, you know what, I'm not as bad as that person. But I'm not as good as that person. So if I work a little bit harder, eventually I'll be as good as that person. You see, what the Pharisee had done is he had created a divide. He had created a divide between him and everyone else around him. I can just imagine what was going through his mind when he stood there with his chest puffed out and all proud. Standing there thinking, God, wow, look at all these people around me that aren't as good as me, that aren't as righteous as me. Oh, do all these things that make me look good. Imagine how he even thought about people coming to God. God, look at these people coming to you filthy. How can they even come to your temple? How dare they even come in your presence? I'm righteous. I deserve to be here. But you don't. How often do we make it difficult for people to come to the temple of God? And I know I take blame and I take responsibility. I've been that person before. I remember when I first got saved. God had done such amazing work in my life. He had literally delivered me from everything. I couldn't understand how people that had given their life to Jesus used to still struggle through things. And it got so bad, I even used to put condemnation on people. I'd say, how can you be saved? You don't even read your Bible every day. How can you be saved? You don't even go to church five times a week. How can you be saved if you're not doing all these things? You see, my friends, what I had done is I'd put a list that I thought was the list that God wanted. But he didn't want that list. So often, we can make a divide between us and the people out there when we forget that we are supposed to be the people bringing in the nations to the church. 
I've been guilty of it myself, which makes it so hard to share on a topic like this because I know God has had to humble me to the point where I can admit that I've made this mistake. But are you willing to make an honest declaration before the Lord where you can say, Lord, I've made that mistake too. And I need to humble myself. And I need to make the doors open for everyone. The Pharisees knew the Scriptures better than anyone in their day. They would have known about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs. They would have known that Abraham was the father of faith. And they would have even known that they were made righteous before the law. Sorry, I just want to have a sip of water. My mouth is dry. They would have known about Adam and Eve. How in the garden they'd made mistakes. They would have known how Adam and Eve did the first sin. And they went and hid themselves from God. They would have known that God called Adam and Eve from their hiding place. They would have known that God gave Adam and Eve a covering. You see, all these things are very important to know because it's God who justifies. The Pharisees even would have known about King David, the murderer, the adulterer. They would have known how he was known as the best king. They would have known about all his sin and all the things that he's done wrong. And David says this, Blessed is the one whose sins are not imputed to him, but who God has forgiven. They would have been able to read these things. And yet they still in their minds would have gone back to dead works, to trying to earn salvation by the things they had done. Hosea 6.6 6 says this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than, than burnt offerings. How many of us here get into the place where we bring burnt offerings before the Lord and all He wants is us to acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior? You see, the Pharisees had made it all about works. They had made it all about themselves and they had forgotten that it was all about God. When they came to pray, when He came to pray, there was no confession there was no asking for forgiveness. There was no praise to God. It was all about me, me, me. So I want to tell you a quick story. There was a very, very wealthy man. And he went on a business trip. And he got off the plane and he was very, very tired. It was a long trip. But he was so excited to go and explore. So what he did, he took his wallet he took his cell phone, he took all his valuables and he put it inside the safe because he wants to go and explore, not thinking that he might need some of them. And all excited, he runs down the stairs to go and explore and he starts traveling through the streets of the city and he looks around and he, and he sees everything. And he just gets so excited and he goes further and further to the point where three hours later, he doesn't know where he is. He's got no valuables. He's got no cell phone. He's got no wallet. Now he's hungry. Or as my wife would say, hangry. <laughs> and he's sitting at that point where he's thinking to himself, how do I get back? And he just sees all these high-rise buildings and everything there. And everyone that's there is speaking different languages. So he can't even communicate properly. So he says to himself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to find my way back. Three hours later, Still can't find his way back. Now he's very hangry. <laughs> and he walks past a shop, a little cafe, and he sees all these sandwiches and pies and sweets and cold drink. And he thinks to himself, Nehemiah, I'm hungry. I'm going to go and get one of those. So he slips into the shop. He walks to the back and he grabs a pie. And he devours that pie. He eats it. Last crumb and all. He puts the plastic back. And he walks straight out the shop, hoping no one will notice him. But the shop steward saw him. And 200 meters down the road, when he thinks he's gotten away with it, the police get there. And they lock him up. And he's sitting in jail. And he thinks to himself, what am I going to do now? 
He started thinking to himself how he can explain himself to get out of the situation. And it even passed through his mind to say, you know what? In that shop, there was hundreds of sweets and hundreds of different sandwiches and, and cakes and burgers and everything. And I only ate one thing. It's not that bad. Then he thought, you know, maybe I must tell them how good I am, how noble I am, how many people I employ back home. But you see, my friends, before the judge, he doesn't care how good you are back home. He doesn't care how many good things you've done up to that point. He doesn't care about how many sweets or things you didn't steal. You're guilty because you stole that one thing. Now imagine being in that situation. What do you do? You need someone to come and pay your bail. So just at the point when the guy was right down, he was out, he thought he was done. He remembered he had a phone call. So he phones his wife. He says, wife, please, I'm in jail. Pay my bail. Pay my bail and I'll be set free. Friends, this is an example of how we need to come to Father God, the good, good Father. You know that even one sin in your life makes you unrighteous? And no matter how many good things you've done, it can never, ever eliminate that wrong that you've done. Never. And that might sound heavy, but unfortunately it's the truth. But there's good news coming, don't worry. You see, God is not a scorekeeper. He doesn't have all your good works on this side and all the mistakes you've made on this side and say you've done more good than bad. He doesn't work like that. Now you've got a tax collector who's very bad. So you've got to understand why the Pharisee was so proud not to be like the tax collector. Tax collectors were the most hated people in their day. In fact, they were more hated than a pedophile. They were more hated than a murderer. They were more hated than anyone. A tax collector is not like SARS we know. <laughs> SARS, you pay your 14% on everything that you buy. You fall into a tax bracket and you pay that every time. And it's legalized. What a tax collector used to do is he used to determine how much you pay. Because the Roman government would say to him, you owe this much at the end of every month. We don't care how you get it, just give it to us. So he had authority to go and tax everyone in his area. So what the tax collector would do, and what used to upset most people, is they had dishonest scales. And God says it's one of the things he hates the most, is dishonest scales. So what the tax collector would do is a friend would come past with a wheelbarrow of fruit. Chugga, 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 chugga. And there's a whole bunch of fruit there. And he says, oh, my friend, I'm going to tax you 10 bucks. And right behind him would come someone else with exactly the size, same size wheelbarrow, same fruit, same everything. And he'll look at the man and say, hey, sir, you owe me a thousand bucks. You see, what they said had to happen. They had the authority. What made them even worse than this is the way that they became a tax collector. To become a tax collector, you had to buy or bribe your way to do it. You couldn't just go to the Roman government and say, listen, I don't want to be a Jew anymore. I want to be a tax collector now. No, it was to the highest bidder. Which doesn't seem that bad until you understand what they had to do. So because they didn't have much money in those days and everything was a barter system and there was coins and whatever, but they couldn't raise enough money to buy the right to be a tax collector. They had to sell their land. Now if you know anything about Israel or you do any biblical theology, you'll understand that land is very important for a witness and as a testimony. So what they used to do is they would sell their land and go and buy the right to be an enemy to their own people. They literally worked for the enemy. To their own nation, they were seen as a turncoat. They were hated. They were hated so much that their family would sometimes even have a funeral for them when they became a tax collector. They were considered as dead to their family, their friends, and their relatives. They hated them that much. 
You've got to understand how serious it was to become a tax collector. Every time your mother has a birthday, you're not invited. Every time your sister gets married or a family member has a, well, hopefully only once. But if your sister gets married or if you have more than one sister, every time your sisters get married, you'd have to, you wouldn't even get invited. If it was your birthday, no phone calls. Can you imagine being that alone? And the scary thing is they would have had to take time to make that decision. Because they literally would have had to go and sell their land. There would have to be an exchanging of hands. They would have made a conscious decision to do this. They would have weighed up the pros and the cons. And the thing about this that makes it so exciting, how many of us have made a mistake in our lives where we've weighed up the pros and the cons and we've chosen against God? You see, it's pride and selfishness to think that you'll be okay on your own. But the good thing about God and the good thing about being sick is when you're sick, you know it. When you start getting the flu, your nose runs, a little bit of a cough comes. If you don't treat it, you start getting a bit worse to the point where you get bronchitis. And if it gets even worse, you can end up in hospital if you're not careful enough. So when you're sick, you know that you're sick. And when you're a sinner and the worst of sinners, you know that you're a sinner. And Jesus says this, I haven't come for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. I've come for the sick. Putting your faith in God is a very humbling thing. You see, when you're a tax collector and you know how bad you are, there is no amount of works that you can do that will be able to make what you've done right again. That's why being in such a bad place isn't always the worst place to be. The Bible said God exalts the humble, but what? God gives grace to the humble. Yeah, God gives grace to the humble, and yeah. God gives grace to the humble, but resists the proud. Thanks, Berger. My brain's slow, bud. So then you look at the temple. What was the point of the temple? The temple is very similar to church we have today. Look at the church. There are people coming here to hear from God. So we don't want to make a big thing about the temple. But the next part talks about the children. And you're going to ask yourself, why are the children so important? In those days, children weren't very important. They were actually looked down upon. So when parents were bringing their children, their little babies, to Jesus to get his hands laid on them, the disciples are like, Jesus, don't worry. We've got this. We know it's not lacquer. We will get rid of the babies. And Jesus says, no. Let me take this as an example to you so you can learn something. And then he changes it from little babies to small children. The important thing about children is they're very humble. They don't worry about their outward appearance. When a father calls them or a mother calls them, they just come running. They don't think, oh, I better fix my suit better polish my shoes. They come dirty, messy, but they just come in faith and in love. There's no pretenses. Another thing about children, when they hurt themselves, the mother and the father know about it. They don't go and try to bandage it up themselves when they're very young because they know if I run to mommy and daddy, they will help me. And that's why he uses the example, the faith of a young child. Because when you run to your Father in heaven, you've got to trust that He will look after you. So the question is, where do you stand? Are you trying to earn your way to heaven? Are you trying to get to heaven by all the good things that you've done? Are you trying to get to heaven by helping the old people across the road, which is a great and noble thing? Or going to the old age homes and sharing with them? Or are you trying to get to heaven by helping the orphans? Or are you in that place where you're hurt and broken and you're coming before the Lord and you're saying, God, I'm hurt and I'm broken and I need you. The second place is the right place to be. You see, the Pharisee was righteous in his own eyes. The difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector is the tax collector went away justified. 
Justified means righteous in the eyes of God. The Pharisee saw himself as righteous. We are not saved by works, but by God's grace. So you might be sitting here tonight saying, Andre, what handles can I take away from this? How do I take what you're saying and apply it to my life? For starters, love your neighbor. We all have the opportunity to bring the worst of the worst to church. We have no right to say, yo, I know how that person acts Monday to Sunday. I don't actually want to bring them to church in case I look bad. I know the leadership in this church. They'll be happy for the worst of the worst to be here. Because their desire is that none should perish. Just as the Lord. So let me say this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Secondly, put your faith in God. How do you know when you've done enough? You see, the biggest problem with most religions, it's all about what I do. And they get to the point where they never know when they've done enough. How do you know when you've done enough if it's about your works? How do you know when you've done enough things to, wrong, to, ro to wash out that wrong that you've done? You can never know. But God has written the law in our hearts so that we can know right from wrong. Imagine that man at the shop, going to the shop steward and saying, here's Monopoly money to pay for the pie I ate. The guy would be like, you're crazy, man. This is the real world. Sometimes we go to God with Monopoly money, our own works, and we try and pay for our sins by our own works. When God says there's only one way to atone for sin, and that's through the shedding of blood. The amazing thing is, God came down and shed His perfect blood for you and for me. The difference is, are we going to take the price that was paid and offer it? Or are we going to go there with our monopoly money when we get to heaven and say, look what I did? The third thing, remember, God gives grace to the humble and He resists the proud. The Bible says not many wise and noble are called, but those who are humble and are willing to understand that they need a Savior. It's very difficult to save someone in the, in the water if they think they're okay and they're busy drowning. But the moment that they know that they need help and they start screaming and waving their hands, then the lifeguard can go out and save them. The fourth, come like a child with no pretenses. You see, there was a young boy and he was walking through the snow after his dad. His desire was to be just like his dad. But his dad used to take big steps. And this boy wanted to be so much like his dad, he used to jump. But he used to fall over all the time. And he never quite made the jump because he was young. But his desire was to be like the father. And he didn't care how many people were around him when he was falling over and even sometimes looking quite stupid. Come to the father like a child. Love the Lord like a child. And the fifth one, not all prayer is genuine. Attitude is just as important as persistence. You see, we can repeat ourselves, but our heart's not in it. And Berger preached a powerful message this morning about how your faith will, will bring the seed to, to bear. But sometimes we don't even have faith. We just pray for the sake of praying. And like the Pharisee, we just repeat ourselves. And God is sitting up in heaven saying, where is your faith, my child, in my word and in my promises? We need to get to that point where we understand it's a heart issue. It's not an outworking issue. You see, the thing that the Pharisees would have missed about David is when David was called, he was the last one to come. Samuel went and looked at all the children of Jesse and he went through all of them and God said, no, 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 no. From biggest to the point where there's none left. And he said to Jesse, is there one left? He said, yeah, I've got a little boy, but he's out in the field. You see, God doesn't look at the outside. God looks at the heart. Because God knew the heart of David. 
We need to be humble enough to understand that we need a Savior. If we don't accept the blood of Jesus to pay for our sins to God the Father, pride is the thing that is keeping us away. So in landing, I just want to say this. Jesus didn't suffer on the cross for no reason. If we were able to get to heaven by the amount of good works that we did, let me tell you, God himself would not have come and suffered the pain that he suffered for my and your sin. He would not have. It wouldn't have been necessary. But he knew that there was no ways that we could pay the price. He knew. So he came and let all his blood be shed. Every single last drop. Just so that he can go to the Father one day and say, Father, the payment has been done. The payment has been done. Sorry, that was my time. So I know I'm done. <laughs> the payment has been done. It has been made. It is complete. And if you are not willing to humble yourself and to receive Jesus as your Savior, then my friend, you're going to get to heaven with monopoly money and it's just not going to be good enough. So in closing, if we can all stand. So I've been at both places. Where I've been too proud and I've been at the place where I've been down in the dumps where I had to crawl back to God. And this evening I want you to, to ask yourself the question humbly before the Lord. Take this time to check your heart before God. No one here can judge you. No one here can tell you whether you're right or wrong. But let me tell you this. God is looking down right now and He sees the state of your heart. You can't hide from Him. And He's asking you this evening, are you willing to humble yourself and receive me as Lord and Savior of your life? No matter how much pain and hurt you've caused other people, no matter how much disappointment, no matter how much you've let people down, even your friends and family, are you willing to come to me and receive me as Lord and Savior?